bathroom to bath home. A couple of assumptions I'm using to do this math. Uh, we're assuming we're paying 7.7 .7 cents a kilowatt hour from the utility. That's how much our electricity costs. That price is going to grow at about 1.79% a year. And we're also assuming that those panels are going to, their output's going to decrease as the panels wear out. I'm also assuming that we're selling our SREX to Ohio and that that market remains viable, meaning the legislature doesn't repeal the legislation that created that market in the first place. And that's actually what could possibly happen. So after 20 years of those solar panels generating electricity, I'm looking at about $11,000 in energy value. So that's the money I didn't have to pay the utility because I produced my own electricity. And then I'm looking at about $17,000 from my SRECs, my Solar Renewable Electricity Credits. So that's giving me a return of about $4,800. One very important uh, caveat is that that SREC market is, you can't predict what's going to happen there. That market's been created by policy. If the state of Ohio hadn't told utilities, you've got to meet a percentage of demand with, with solar, and you can buy RECs from Kentucky to do that, then nobody would be buying those SRECs from me. So if that law gets repealed, and I have no control over what happens in Ohio, then there no longer is a market and there no longer is a value. And so that's a very challenging piece of uncertainty when it comes to solar. If the value of SRECs stay where they are today and don't go back up, you'd be looking at about $4,000 in SREC value, and so your system would not pay for itself in 20 years. Um, so I kind of hesitate to put these slides in here because I think people look at it and be like, well, why would anyone do solar? It doesn't pay for itself, or maybe it won't pay for itself if the SRECs don't come through. But I think that you have to have like maybe a different perspective. That $23,000 that's my cell phone payment for the next 20 years. So if I think about what I pay per month for my cell phone, assuming that that's not going to increase, which you know it will because Apple's going to keep trying to sell me more stuff, that's about what I'm going to be paying over the next 20 years for my cell phone. You also think about your vehicle. Somebody might go out easily and spend $23,000 on a car, drive it for five years, trade it in, maybe get about four or 5000 on the trade-in, if they're lucky and then go buy another car. I don't get a return on investment when I pay my electric bill. You know, KU doesn't send me money because I've paid my electric bill. But people want solar to pay for itself. And it's not surprising because you're producing electricity which can be sold, has a value, and so we really kind of we want it to work like our mutual funds or our 401k works. But there are people out there that are investing in solar even though they know the numbers aren't so great. And people might think, well, that's crazy. Why are they doing it? Well, they're doing it because they want green power, because they want to live off the grid, because they really like the technology. And they're early adopters. So someone like myself, who is not an early adopter, who is carrying around a three-year-old phone that's broken, is waiting on the iPhone 5 to come out. It's not coming out. I'm going to get a 4. It's fine. No big deal. Um, you know, iPhones have been around for, what, two, three years, and I'm still not carrying one. But there are people out there that are investing in solar, giving these numbers, and it's bringing the cost down for the rest of us. So it's a very positive thing. And they're not thinking of it as an investment. They're thinking of it as prepaying for their electricity. And one of the things that they're getting out of this deal is they're, they know they're locking in that, that price. So if our electricity prices climb in the future, and I'll show you what we think they're going to do, they don't have to worry because they're not paying for fuel. You don't have to pay for the sun. Once you've invested in that system and it's working and it's operating, you know what those kilowatt hours are going to cost you. I don't know what your kilowatt hours are going to cost you 15 years from now. We can guess, but we don't know. So, policies. Net metering, we talked about this. When your solar panels are making a whole lot of electricity at noon, on a summer day and you're not there using it, it's sending that electricity to the utility, it's putting it on the grid, and you're getting a credit. Standard offers, the TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, they pay a premium for renewable energy. They'll pay 23 cents a kilowatt hour for solar. Whereas here in Kentucky with net metering, you're getting about 8 cents. Renewable portfolio standards, this is what they have in Ohio, where they tell the utility, 
you must meet a percentage of electricity demand with renewables. 29 states in the District of Columbia have these laws. So the majority of states in the U.S. have said, we want more renewable power, and we are going to mandate it, and we're going to pay for it. Public benefit funds, this is where you get grants and loans. Everybody pays a little bit on their bill. It creates a public fund, and then you use that money to provide grants to, say, UK or the public school down the road to put solar panels and other renewables up. Third-party financing, this is actually an area I'm really interested in. It allows you to purchase the electricity from the solar panels without owning it. Or it allows you to lease the solar panels. So if you're a renter, you don't know if you're going to be in your house for 20 years, you can't afford the upfront cost, it allows you to still get that electricity, own that electricity, use that electricity, but you pay per month. See, here in the U.S., we pay per month for everything, right? We pay our car payment per month, we pay our mortgage, we pay our cell phone, we pay for our electricity. We don't prepay for anything. So it can be kind of difficult to pay up front that 20 some odd thousand dollars for your solar array. But third-party financing allows you to pay per kilowatt hour. Um, it's a legal issue in Kentucky because in Kentucky, you have to buy your power from the utility that serves you. So you can't really shop. Have you ever shopped around for electricity? You don't have the option to do that. You could possibly shop around for other things, but not for electricity. And so um, it makes it difficult in Kentucky. Some states have passed laws. States with net metering, we've made the map. This is the only map we've made that I'm going to show you. Um, Tennessee is white, but they've got the tea. They're served by the Tennessee Valley Authority, and they do they pay even more than what we do. So it's not technically net metering, but it's still a good deal. States with an RPS, this is the 29 states in the District of Columbia that mandate renewables. So, you know, people out there have basically added up all of these mandates and have figured out how much renewables we're going to be adding in the U.S. And so it's an industry that's going to grow quite a bit because of these state mandates. There is no <coughs> national mandate. Um, there was talk by the former Congress to do a national portfolio standard, but that seems to be off the table these days. So I don't think we're going to see that anytime soon, uh, but you may see more states adding these portfolio standards in the future. You see kind of the southeast, none of those states, but most of those states do not have a portfolio standard. And of course, Kentucky, we don't have one. Public benefit funds and states that allow third-party finance. So let me show you why policy is so important. This is a payback period for solar. The red is 60 years or more. The green is less than five. Okay, again, if you're caring about your payback period, you're caring about the return, this is what happens if you have no incentives. This is what your map looks like with incentives. And so you're greatly reducing your payback period. In some cases, you're under five years. In some places in Kentucky, you're doing pretty good. And that, that little uh, green area in our, in our state, that's the area that's served by the Tennessee Valley Authority. Again, they pay that premium for renewable energy. So you can see that, as I mentioned earlier, renewables are very much policy driven. That, that's why we're seeing a boom in the United States right now. It's incentives. Um, additionally, you have those renewable portfolio standards. This is, this is why we're going to continue to get more of those renewables and see, see those industries grow and become stronger. So talk a little bit about the future. As I mentioned, Kentucky is a coal state. We get about 93% of our electricity from coal. We do that because it's the cheapest form. It's at low cost. It keeps our rates low. We've attracted energy intensive industries to Kentucky, steel, aluminum, automobile. Um, we have, I think, the third lowest electricity rates in the nation. That, that's good. It's good for our economy. It's good for us as ratepayers. Uh, the challenge is that there is a whole slew of new environmental rules coming online that have the ability to increase the cost of extracting and combusting coal for electricity. And so here we sit in a state that gets the majority of their electricity from coal. We're having to face this dead on. Whereas other states that have more diversified portfolios may not have the same challenge that we have in Kentucky. Um, already utilities are looking at natural gas. Louisville Gas and Electric.